with that, I'm going to go ahead and press record and we are going to jump in to today's session. It is 12.03. Um, my name is Emily Bagwell. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I'm the resource manager for Reconciling Ministries Network, and it is my joy to get to and welcome you into this space today where you have joined us for part two, a second session of a conversation that is happening between two of what we call our extension ministries. It's hosted and led by Parents Reconciling Network, who has been doing a series um, of conversations um, to both support and um, continue to learn alongside each other as we um, seek to love more fully the LGBTQ community. That may be um, a child, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, or just a loved one. You may be a faithful ally um, in this movement towards justice and full inclusion for all of God's children. And so we are grateful for PRN and the work that they do. And we have partnered with UMADI, which is United Methodist Alliance for Transgender Inclusion, another one of our extension ministries. Um, and we are grateful for just this partnership um, to extend the conversation as we talk about some of the challenges, issues, difficulties, joys uh, all along the way as we journey together um, and again, learn alongside one another. And so you are jumping in. If this is your first call, um, you, you will not uh, be lost. Your, uh, there are other videos that you can go back and watch. Um, we'll make sure that you get connected with those opportunities um, for um, looking back at what we've already done. But it is completely great for you just to step in where you are today. We have um, some wonderful leaders who are going to help guide us in our conversation. I'm going to let each one of them introduce themselves at um, the, the time that, that they speak. Um, so, But I will just call your attention, um, and I'll just use their first names as, as we uh, go right now and ask them if they would uh, just give a little wave so people can begin to see what squares. It's nice to have d many different pages, uh, but uh, Dan, if you'll give a wave, and John, a little wave, and Henry are going to be our main leaders and facilitators in today's conversation. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge uh, the PRN chair, Jim Waugh, who is on here as well. Um, I wanted to share with you just a couple of our kind of ground rules or just kind of how to function on Zoom. I know many of you are on Zoom all the time, um, but we really do want this to be a conversation, a discussion, um, and yet there's a lot of us, so we can't just all unmute and talk um, with ease. Um, so we would encourage you to use the chat function. Um, you are welcome to send that a comment um, to the group as a whole if it's something that you want to put out in our space together. Uh, if you're not comfortable doing so, but have something that you would love to bring into the space or a question or curiosity that you might feel a little bit more hesitant about, you'll note that you have the, the blue bar in the chat that typically is highlighted everyone. If you want to send a private message, you can do so to me. Again, my name is Emily Bagwell, um, and I can help bring that into the space as we have conversation. Um, again, we have these leaders who are going to guide us in today's conversation, um, but they have um, said and are, are would welcome you to um, to enter a question at, at that point. If you have a question, don't hesitate or wait till the end. You can go ahead and um, enter it into our space because um, we, we want to, as much as Zoom um, has its limitations, we want this to be a conversation. So if you have something you'd like to add um, to our time together today, please feel free to go ahead and do so. I will ask you if you could keep yourself on mute unless you are speaking or um, have a question that you're you're um, giving out loud just so that it helps with background noise so that we can focus on the person that is in, in front of us. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and launch into today's discussion. Um, and I am going to invite Dan um, to introduce themselves and to um, get us started with our conversation today. Thanks for being here. Uh, again, I, I echo thanks for everyone being here. My name is Dan Levine. Um, I am a licensed local pastor in Atlanta, Georgia, and I am a, a second year seminarian at Candler School of Theology. And my role with the Reconciling Ministries Network is that I'm the uh, convener for the United Methodist Alliance for Transgender Inclusion. 
So I'm really glad to be able to partner with with the Parents Reconciling Network in in bringing these forward. Um, some of what I'm discussing today. Oh, my pronouns are he, him, his. So, uh, some of what I'm discussing today. Uh, I've got a couple of different things, but what we're going to start off with is a uh, survey or a poll that I put out both in uh, Umadi's closed Facebook group and in some other public areas to uh, gender exploring, gender diverse, uh, gender variable individuals, looking to understand what are some things that they may have wanted people to either know or wanted people to do. So there were four questions and I'm gonna go in order. I'm gonna share a few of the responses, not all of them, because some of them overlap quite a bit because uh, while everybody's, um, everybody's experiences are different, there are some things that remain constant. So these are the things that are gonna remain constant. Um, um, we're going to, to go through some of that. So the first question I asked was, what would you want or have wanted from your parents after you came out? And um, some of them were, were really consistent, the acceptance, uh, less resistance, acceptance. Um, them to accept me for who I am. Love, for them to allow me to explore new names and pronouns without judgment and without outing me to others. Um, that one was, uh, pretty constant and not outing um, your child, your child to uh, to anyone else without their permission, and uh, allowing them to tell their story. Uh, some people wanted help with a new name, uh, and to uh, to go through that experience with their parents, recognizing the the struggle that parents go through in naming their children to begin with, understanding that that we don't even necessarily have the answers for ourselves as we're going through the process, as we're coming into who we are. Uh, sometimes when we come out to those we love, it's I'm having this feeling and I'm not quite sure what it is. And if you can just be, be with me through this process, I don't have all the answers, but be open to exploring together. Um, someone said a gender affirmation ceremony was instrumental in transition. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, some parents were rea some parents reactions were really good. And uh, one of the things that that this person was really a fan of was that their parents heard out what they had to say, they listened to them, and admitted that they don't understand and uh, wanted to discuss it further, and took the opportunity to educate themselves other than asking their child. And some of the responses were just support, just simple support in my, in my process. This, the next question that I asked was not just for, for uh, interactions with parents. It was, what are examples of questions that are okay for people to ask? And again, some of the, the um, responses were pretty similar. What pronouns would you like to use? Almost everybody had something about pronouns. Uh, someone said, well, what does that mean to you? Uh, what does gender mean to you? How do you view gender? How do you see gender? Um, what makes you comfortable? How can we help you feel more included, welcomed, loved? Um, are you out to everyone or to certain people? So when someone, so when your child or, or someone comes out to you, a, a good question to ask is, is this public information? Do only certain people have it? And if certain people know, who are the people who know so I can avoid outing you? And that, so that creates a safe space for your child to come and, and be honest with you about how they're feeling. Uh, when did you start feeling this way? Was a question. What has your experience been with XYZ? Understanding how, you know, how your child is experiencing uh, either interactions with doctors, interactions in public. Generally, it, 
uh, these are things about its personal experience. So you asking about how they experience things and what are the ways that you can uh, you can make them feel more loved, inclus included, and affirmed. Then on the other side, I ask the opposite of that. There are um, a lot of questions that transgender individuals get asked that are highly inappropriate and uh, they can also trigger gender dysphoria. And so um, these are some, some of the questions that transgender individuals should never be asked. And if someone asks a trans individual, your child or not in front of you, uh, it would be a great opportunity for you to step in and say, you know, that's not really a, a great question. And before I even go into some of the answers, one of the rules of thumb, just generally speaking and in, in talking with and asking trans people about different aspects of their life, if you would not ask someone you didn't know was transgender this question, if you would think it was rude, if they were not, if you didn't know they were trans, then it's still rude if they're transgender. Um, it, our status as a, or our identity as a transgender individual does not make that question not rude. And so some of these answers are, what are your genitals? Um, another one that, that is commonly asked under that same, under that same is what's in your pants. That's a, a very common thing that that many of us get asked. Um, have you had the surgery? That is another common question that we get asked, and um, it's inappropriate for several reasons. Uh, one, uh, transgender individuals don't always have the same transition process, and so the surgery for those who are medically transitioning is different for each person. Are we talking about, you know, what surgery are you talking about? There are several different options. But then on top of that, there are individuals who choose not to medically transition or cannot medically transition due to either a pre-existing condition where it's not safe for them or, or any other reason. And understanding that those who decide not to medically transition are just as valid as those who medically transition. And so asking that question can be really harmful for people. Uh, someone said that they were asked, how transgender are you? Which just in general is an awkward question. Again, if, if you wouldn't ask a cisgender person, which is simply someone who's, who identifies with the sex they were assigned at birth. If you wouldn't ask that question to someone who wasn't trans, then it's then it's not really an appropriate question. Uh, another aspect is, what's your what's your old name, your dead name, your real name? Um, so that came up quite a few times, and part of the the aspect of that is people have different relationships, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on again with their pre-transition self. And sometimes it is very hurtful and harmful for an individual. Um, I know that it, in hearing this, it can be difficult for parents to hear, but for transgender individuals, sometimes it's really harmful to think about themselves pre-transition. And that includes the name that they were given at birth. And um, again, everybody's transition is different. Everybody's experience is different. Um, then there were, uh, what's another question? Questions about trauma, um, asking about, you know, why are you transgender? We don't really know why people are transgender. Uh, there are very different theories scientifically. There are different aspects, but the thing to know is it's, uh, that um, when someone is experiencing um, and going through the process of determining what their gender is and, and they're beginning to explore what gender means to them, that is um, our identities have nothing to do with trauma that we may have experienced as a child. Our identities have nothing to do with anything parents have done wrong. 
in fact, someone who is um, who is able to communicate that with you as their as their parent that they are experiencing gender dysphoria and are coming into a different gender identity than what they grew up with, what they were assigned at birth is a testament to how much they care about you as their parent to come forward and say, this is, this is who I am. And it, and it can sometimes be an indication of their relationship with you as being strong, not as being something that was um, in conflict. The last question that I asked was, uh, what are some examples of things you think parents need to know? Um, one person said the difference between gender dysphoria and gender euphoria. Uh, so gender dysphoria is um, either physical, social, mental. It, it can come in different ways, but it's how you are perceived by other people or how your body um, aligns with your gender. So uh, some individuals have body, bodily gender dysphoria, where their body doesn't match how they view themselves. Um, and some people simply have social gender dysphoria, which means they, um, they are at odds with how the world views them and how the world um, views their gender. So they, that's when, when we talk about social, that's transitioning with a name and pronouns, um, and sometimes with gender expression, but not always. Uh, and not every trans person experiences gender dysphoria, but they will experience gender euphoria by experiencing, um, if someone were to refer to them as, as sir, and, um, and they're uh, presenting as male and, and they don't even, they don't feel bad about generally having been presenting as female in their past, but but the idea of someone calling them sir really feels right. And it gives them a sense of this is who I am. Um, that can be uh, gender euphoria. And so you don't necessarily have to experience gender dysphoria to, to be trans, but gender euphoria in expressing and being seen as the, the way you're identifying. Um, neo pronouns, which are um, those pronouns that are not he, he, him, his, she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. So neo pronouns, um, I couldn't even begin to list because there are so many of them. They are valid um, and as difficult as it can be to get used to them, uh, we, in recognizing that um, the way we think of gender in a binary way is outdated um, and it, it, you don't necessarily need, know an individual's gender until they tell you um, because expression doesn't always indicate gender. And John put an example in the, um, in the chat of one of the neo pronouns. Um, sometimes trans people will, will make jokes or puns about themselves. And sometimes that's, that's kind of how, how they handle uh, part of their transition. Um, and it gives, gives us an opportunity to be, um, to make a little bit light for our own mental health. Uh, and so you, you know how they say comedians tend to have some sort of uh, depression that they're working through. And sometimes trans folks kind of have that, that humor about them, but it, it's one of those things that um, just being supportive in that. Another person said, God loves everyone. Life is confusing, gender is fluid, love is love. And um, someone else said, no matter what, they are still your child. You might not know them like they know themselves. It is not a phase. And sometimes people will make, uh, make us feel dysphoric, but we recognize that they're not bad people. Um, it's just a, a behavior that we would like to see change, changed. Healthcare is going to be a problem 
for binary transgender kids and even adults, especially um, transmasculine individuals, those who were assigned female at birth, um, who will need uh, to look for um, for physicians, um, gynecologists who will uh, help to care for the anatomy that they were born with. Um, and so as soon as, as soon as possible, looking for uh, trans friendly, queer friendly uh, medical providers. And that's, you know, we're not just talking about specialty areas, we're talking about family practice, we're talking about dentist's office, we're talking about um, mental health care, generally speaking. Um, absolutely every area of medicine, there are physicians who are uh, queer affirming and, and queer friendly. And um, so it's important that as your child is going through, even if your, your child is an adult, sometimes helping them find uh, local, yes, pharmacies as well. Um, there was a big scandal, not, not only a couple of years ago, that CVS was giving a lot of trouble to trans folks going for um, hormone replacement therapy. There were a lot of issues with some of the larger corporate pharmacies. So finding pharmacies, thank you, John, um, that are trans friendly is also very important. Heavily gendered environments such as baby showers uh, can be very, uh, very difficult for trans kids, trans adults, um, especially those who are closeted. So if they have come out to you and they're not really expressing uh, in public yet their true gender expression for any number of reasons, and Henry's going to talk a little bit about visibility and, and safety a little bit later, but um, asking your child to go stealth or and dresses the, the gender they were assigned with in public places uh, can be very, very harmful. Um, another thing is that uh, someone said, don't talk about mourning the child that you lost or talking sadly about how you wanted a gender they were assigned with um, and now you don't have one. Um, be open to going through the journey with your child um, there are ways that you can, you can express your grief over the changes in your child's life and what that means for you, but don't express that grief with your child. Um, there are, uh, we recommend, you know, seeing therapists or counselors, finding a support group where there are other parents of transgender individuals. If you accidentally misgender your child, um, catch yourself repeat the correct word, either pronoun or name or gender, and move on like you made any other speech error. Don't dwell on it. Um, making, making a, dwelling on it brings more, more focus to it in the conversation. Whether or not they had, they had caught it themselves, uh, they will, your child will appreciate you making the correction. And so that's important to know. Someone said the best way to make sure you don't misgender them is to actually change about how you think about your child rather than viewing the pronoun as something you need to remember when speaking. So, and this again can take a lot of time and understanding that it is a process, not just for the transgender person, but for their family as well. And this is why we recommend that parents have a support system of their own outside of their, ch their child, um, either a support group or a, um, or a therapy relationship so that you can work through as, as parents some of what you're, what you're going through emotionally and mentally. Um, someone, and, and it's not as big of a problem in this situation, but generally speaking, when talking about you know, other, other places, if parents are limited by Christian claims, um, someone said they should know that Jesus told us to love one another and that judging was God's job. Um, so in, as you, if you hear people talking poorly about trans people, 
in general, that's something that we can remember to share is that Jesus talked about loving one another. Um, and I think that was uh, one person said, don't try to understand it. It's an experience that you that unless you experience yourself, you won't be able to understand. And that's OK. Um, and you it's one of those things to uh, that we ask that you accept and support through the process. So that's the conclusion of, of the questions. And I'll come back, I believe, later on to talk about some more. Great, thank you, Dan. And again, that was for, for some of you who didn't get the full context of, that was a survey or a questionnaire that um, Dan shared with some uh, people through the Umadi network and uh, just who were willing to respond. And so we're very grateful for people's willingness to take the opportunity and the time to, to help communicate and to, to share and help us learn a little bit more. John's gonna share with us uh, next. So John, um, if you don't mind introducing yourself and uh, you can share with us now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is John Ongermeyer. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and they, them, theirs. Um, I consider myself non-binary now as of like a month ago. So um, this sort of is a testament to that gender is fluid concept. Um, and I wanted to touch on a few things that Dan uh, mentioned. Um, one of which I will be talking about uh, in a little bit more detail, um, but that the uh, gender neutral word for niece and nephew is one of my favorite words ever. Um, if any of you have uh, nieces or nephews that are transitioning to a non-binary uh, gender identity, um, my favorite word for it is nibbling. Um, little nibbling is very cute. Uh, it's a cute word for cute little people um, in your life. Uh, and then the I was going to touch on the dysphoria and euphoria, so thank you for doing that, um, Dan. And I would say that the the euphoria was a big tip to me. Um, early on that there was a gender thing going on. Um, my story, I didn't know from a young age that I was trans. Um, I was, uh, up until about the age of 20, 21, I was very okay identifying as a woman, just a very butch woman. Um, I was a tomboy when I was little, uh, came out as bisexual my sophomore year of high school, and then as a lesbian my senior year of high school, between junior and senior year. Um, and then it was about three, four or five years later that I started to transition and it was really that euphoria that sort of tipped it off. Um, and one of the stories I tell is my grandma and I were at a, uh, we were visiting someone in the hospital and we went down to the gift shop to buy flowers or something. And I was, um, I had my hair, I already had my hair cut short, uh, wearing baggy shorts, baseball cap, um, pretty masculine looking, but still identi identifying as a female. Um, and the cashier called me, sir. And my grandma, who is from Texas, went off. And she was, that is my granddaughter. You will call her ma'am. And like, just went off. Um, and I was like, grandma, no, good news, don't make a scene. And like half of it was embarrassment because she was making a scene. And then half of it, I had to sort of sit and reflect on for a little bit. But when I got called sir, it felt so right and so good. Um, and like, I never felt comfortable with ma'am. And I just sort of assumed that was my age. Like who calls a 14 year old ma'am? Like, <laughs> um, but you know, it, uh, that euphoria was really something that tipped it off to me that like, hey, something's going on. Um, and Another thing that Dan touched on earlier, early on in that, um, in the discussion of those questions of that survey, uh, is that we don't always have the answers to the questions ourselves. Um, and part of, part of being the parent of a trans kid, I think, is allowing them space to process without you. Um, and so I would really encourage you to have a conversation with them about who um, maybe out of your friend group, your adult friend group or uh, family member that might 
you might think is supportive or an adult friend that they know that they can talk to um, and have a conversation about if it's okay for them, if they would feel comfortable coming out to them and processing some of that stuff with them. Um, Because I know that early on in my transition, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do hormones. I wasn't sure if I wanted any surgeries. I wasn't sure about anything. I was very on the fence about all of the mostly medical stuff. Um, uh, But I was on the fence on a lot of it. Uh, And it felt really uncomfortable to process some of that with my parents. Um, We didn't quite have that relationship. You might have that kind of relationship with your child, but I, I kind of didn't. And so I found friends of my parents um, who were supportive and in the uh, LGBTQ plus community um, that I could talk to and sort of process through, do I really want to start hormones? What would HRT look like? What, am I okay with a receding hairline and growing facial hair? Turns out I am. Um, (laughs) It's, you know, there's, there has to be a space for your child to process and I, and, and you shouldn't be offended by that. Um, that I think is the main takeaway from this is that your child needs space to process and sometimes it might not happen directly with you. Um, But if you maintain that supportive relationship and maintain that space where they can come to you, they will come to you with their decisions or the tail end of the processing or as time goes on, more and more of their processing and discernment process. Uh, as they look at these things. I know that it's been a lot easier in the last few years um, to go through those conversations with my parents. Um, It was very difficult to talk about things like top surgery with my parents very early on, Um, but I had my hysterectomy last summer and I was like, hey mom, we're doing this. How do do I deal with the, how do I, what do I do? Like we were able to have that conversation. Um, So yeah. uh, and we just, sometimes we just need that space. Um, and that, that importance of who knows, that question of who knows and who doesn't know uh, when your child comes up to you is so important. Um, because if, if, if you're the first person they tell and they say, nobody else knows, but I want other people to know, I don't know how to go about doing it. Maybe you can figure out a way to do that. Um, I. For my coming out, I personally um, came out to most, to a good portion of my, I came out personally like face-to-face to the extended family that I see frequently. Um, and then a good share of friends. Um, and then I got really tired of doing that, uh, but I was still in college and I was in a theater department. So I just told the person with the loudest mouth in the theater department and let her do the work for me. Um, and it worked <laughs> by the time I, I told her like at the beginning of the summer and by the time I got back in the fall, everybody knew. Um, of course they had questions and some of them were the inappropriate ones, but we made it through. Um, Yeah, and then after that, we sent out a letter to just everybody we could think of. We put out like a, hey, we wanna send out a family letter thing on Facebook. Um, I typed up a letter about, this is the process I've been going through and we sent that out and that's how I came out to the rest of friends and family, um, the extended family and all of that. So, um, yeah, and so, Yeah, I guess for for this portion, my big takeaway is don't be offended if your child is processing with other people and not you right off the bat, just because it can be really uncomfortable and having multiple places of support is actually a really good thing, especially multiple places of support from adults if we're talking about kids, um, kids in particular. um, And as in support groups, um, look out for SOFA, groups, S-O-F-F-A. Uh, it stands for significant others, friends, families, and friends, families, and I don't remember what the A, allies, right? Allies. Uh, so significant others, friends, family, and allies. There we go. I, I always forget one of the letters. <laughs> um, those are the support, at least out here in Colorado, that's what we call them, um, SOFA groups. 
so keep an eye out for those um, to do your processing because a lot of your processing shouldn't be done with your kid either. Um, you, there, there might be some grief, there will be some grief um, that you, there's a loss of expectations for your child. There's, um, there is a new fear that comes for your child's safety with this. Um, my mom and I have talked about that a couple of times um, that it's just kind of scary, um, but that's not necessarily something that needs to be processed with the person in transition because they're processing enough uh, on their own. So, um, and then I have, a, I think, a little bit more later on. Thank you, John. Appreciate your sharing. Henry, if you will, introduce yourself and share with us. Hi, my name is Henry. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am an ordained elder working in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, um, where I am a pastor of uh, youth evangelism and inclusive ministries. Yes, those three things do go together. Um, I uh, have been asked to say again what I said in a meeting the other day, and I may not say it word for word exactly like I did, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I, so I am here primarily as an ally to my trans siblings, um, in this conversation, um, as somebody who, uh, identifies as genderqueer, um, I am not trans, but it is important that we have a conversation, I feel, about the gender expansiveness of, this conversation that we're having. Um, as I know for me, I if I had had a little bit more understanding when I was younger or had family members that were more in tune with what I was going through, then maybe it would have been easier for me and I wouldn't be trying to figure this out in my 30s. Um, and, uh, but that is what it is. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit specifically about pronoun usage. Um, there's an article that I'm gonna, I'm gonna share an article about an article um, in the chat. Emily has the uh, PDF of the full research article, but I found this article particularly helpful in terms of thinking about how to be supportive of um, trans and gender expansive teens in particular, but I think that a lot of what they talk about in the article is really um, beneficial to adults as well and young adults um, in this conversation. Uh, the big thing that the article pointed out is this was a study that was done out of Stanford um, and looked at the levels of support that trans and gender expansive teens felt from their parents in the process and what those that support looked like. The most basic thing that you can do is use the right pronouns and use the right name. Use the right pronouns and use the right name. That is by that is <laughs> according to this study, the thing that led to the most affirmation. Um, for um, a lot of the teens as they were kind of going through, whether they were going through transition or figuring out who they were in the midst of the world, what, what was most important was that their family members, their parents use the right names and the right pronouns. Um, the other piece is being there and being a listening ear and being somebody that your teen or your uh, young adult or your adult child or nibbling, as John, <laughs> John reminded us, feels comfortable coming to and having conversation with. Um, and by and large, what the study showed was that in supportive climates, so in climates where trans and gender expansive teens felt the most comfortable and supported, generally speaking, the support that was felt by the teen or young adult was higher than the perceived support of the parents, if that makes sense. So the perceived support that pa parents perceived support that they were offering 
was lower than the perceived support that the trans or gender expansive child felt because they were constantly second guessing themselves, whether or not they were getting everything right, whether or not they were doing all the right things and saying all the right things and had all the right answers to all the right questions and all of that when the bare bones of it was, do you respect who I am? Do you respect who I'm telling you that I am? Um, that really come, is what it comes down to for, um, according to that study. And I found that story, that study really helpful in kind of giving some credibility to my own wrestling with my pronouns and wrestling that recently during the pandemic, I finally started claiming my they, them pronouns. Um, and, uh, it has been interesting to say the least. I had a, uh, my, my brother had a child during the pandemic. So there was the question of what am I called in relationship to this child? Um, I cannot tell you the level of affirmation that was felt when my mom the other day referred to me as auntie. That's auntie, like uncle and auntie together. Um, like just that affirmation. And then when I sat down with my mom and I was able to actually have a conversation with her and say, I don't know what I want my kids to call me one day. She didn't have to ask the question because of her supportive demeanor. I was able to come to her and say, I'm struggling to find the answer to this question right now because I want kids one day, but what am I going to have my kids call me? And I threw a few names out and my mom was like, that sounds really cute. Um, <laughs> and was very supportive and jovial and was a conversation partner during that process. Um, and so while you may be sitting here thinking, okay, how do I get into the depths of what my child is struggling with? Sometimes your child may not want you in the depths of what they're struggling with. Um, they may want you just to be the surface level support that they can count on. The support that they can count on that is going to say, I love you as you have told me that you want me to love you. Um, but sometimes they may want those deeper questions. Um, they may want those deeper relationships. And a lot of that is allowing, <laughs> my kids can call me checkbook, uh, apparently. Um, <laughs> um, but I think that one of the things that the most powerful moment for me, though, was when my brother, who is a, he has his PhD in sociology and did uh, gender um, and sexuality studies when he was getting his PhD, and he said to me one day, Henry, I just don't get these they, them pronouns thing. We've got to find something better than that. And I looked at him and I said, well, you go and you do the research and find something and bring it back to me and I'll tell you whether or not it works for me. And it clicked. My brother was just like, oh, this isn't about me and my research and having it all together. This is about what you're telling me. This is about who you see yourself as. Um, and that was one of the most profound moments for me mo most recently um, in terms of pronoun usage. Um, but again, I think it's important that um, for me in this conversation, especially as it relates to the trans experience and as a, for any of us who aren't trans ourselves on this call, um, finding spaces like this to educate ourselves outside of putting that pressure on the people that we have personal relationships with is really important. Uh, Dan's going to speak in a few minutes about something that I'm personally very interested to hear more about as a pastor. Um, and so, and I know John has a couple more stories to share, um, but I'm just going to shut up now and be, <laughs> and look forward to hearing more from my friends, from my colleagues here um, on this call. Henry, we really do appreciate your presence as well and uh, your witness um, in this conversation. Um, and 
Dan and John, I want to let you continue in our time. I do, we, we seek to be really respectful of our time together. So we will finish at one. There will not be a chance to say all the things. This is an ongoing conversation and I hope that you view it as that as well. But we're gonna keep going uh, with our time. Again, you're welcome to use the chat, even if we don't get to everybody's questions or, or comments, um, there will be time and weeks ahead um, for us to, to continue in, in dialogue. Um, um, and we'd love to capture some of those questions that we can incorporate into future um, talks. So uh, I believe, I don't know, Dan, John, who wants to go next um, as we continue the conversation today? Um, I can speak, uh, I can tell my name story. Uh, that might be the next best way to go into this. And then uh, we can lead a little bit into the liturgies of name, name changing ceremonies if we have a little bit of time. Um, so my name story is a little, it's sometimes hard to tell, um, but I do like to tell the story. Uh, so early on in my transition, I was living in a small town in Kansas of about 12,000. Um, and I initially chose a name that was fairly gender neutral. Um, because sometimes it was safer to exist as a very butch lesbian, and sometimes it was safer to exist as a newly out trans man, um, just because of where I was living and all of that. Um, and the name I picked was Jordan. Uh, it, I had various reasons for it. Um, and I, I went by this name for a while, uh, created a Facebook page with the new name, did the whole thing. Um, my cousins knew about it. I think one of my aunts knew about it, but I hadn't told my parents yet, and in particular, my mom. And my mom's view of my name, when she gave me her, my name at birth, I was named for my grandmothers, and she felt like it was one of the very first gifts that she ever gave me, and it was very important to her. Um, and so when I chose Jordan, um, made the Facebook and then commented on a cousin's uh, picture with the wrong profile. Uh, my mom saw the name and saw the profile and was immediately upset. She felt like I had rejected um, the very first gifts and that I no longer wanted connection to various aspects of my family. Um, one of my grandmothers passed before I was born. Um, so that was really important. Um, that name was really important. Uh, and this discovery of the alternate Facebook page led to probably our biggest fight ever, um, knock down, drag out, screaming match. Um, and what essentially ended up happening was I kind of went, well, if you don't like it, then give me a new name. And there wasn't a lot that was said right in the moment. But the next day, um, the next morning, my mom came down the stairs and handed me a piece of paper that said Matthew John. Um, we compromised on the spelling of John because I am not French. Um, <laughs> but uh, we had a conversation about what my name would be and what I would have been named had I been assigned male at birth. Um, and so, Instead of being named for grandmothers, I am now named for great grandfathers. Um, Matthew was the first name that I would have been given had I been assigned male at birth. I go by John because I have a cousin, Matthew. Um, while I am the oldest Matthew, he got the name first. Uh, so we will respect that and I will go by John. Um, and the other thing that comes with these new names is new nicknames. Um, this can be really exciting and it can also be a little bit painful. Um, there's some that uh, my mom actually messaged is on the call um, and she messaged me saying that she misses calling me Dandel. Um, my dad is Austrian and so we had uh, some German nicknames for me when I was growing up and so she misses some of those. Um, she used to call me Chickadee and early on she felt really weird about calling me Chickadee because it had the word chick in it and I was like I don't I, 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 mom, I don't care. <laughs> um, and things like that. Um, so sometimes it can be really powerful to have a conversation around what would you like to be called? Does this name feel comfortable? Do you want 
help with your new name. I having that conversation can be really important and powerful, um, and as well as nicknames. Um, and for a, my initials stayed the same. And for a lot of my childhood, I went by MJ um, as a nickname. And one of my aunts, who was not as accepting, uh, in fact, we're civil. We'll go with that. Um, we, she asked if she could still call me MJ. And I told her no, because to her, I knew in her brain that would still keep me female in her brain. I knew that that wouldn't be enough of a disconnect for her to actually make that new connection with my male identity. Um, I don't know what's going to happen when I tell her I'm non-binary now, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, but it's, you know, there's be conscious of the nicknames, but also the names. If your child says, I really connect and identify with this name, it means a lot to me. Respect that. That's all it is. It's that basic respect and support of believing someone when they tell you, who, when they tell you who they are, basically. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that was really important for my mom um, and me uh, was the name changing ceremony that we did where it was a remembrance of baptism. Um, and when I was a baby, my grandfather baptized me uh, and did the ceremony. And then when I was rechristened, um, uh, when I was rechristened, I he participated in the ceremony as well and anointed my forehead with oil and was part of the claiming of the new identity and the new name. Um, and I know that Dan wanted to um, speak on that. And we also have a question about the cost of name changes. Um, and I can speak to that very quickly. It varies state by state and sometimes county by county. Uh, so that is very much a local, look up your state uh, government website and it should have a name change process. Either your state or your county government website should have a name change, change process. There is the Colorado name change project that you can Google, which has an example, but it's specifically for Colorado name change progress processes. Um, but there might be some for other states as well. Uh, so yes, but I do wanna um, make sure we have time. Yes, uh, it is expensive and it takes time. I am still in the middle of it. Um, it yeah, and the laws change all the time, so you have to keep an eye on it. Yeah. So to to before we go into the the service, I know that we've got just a few minutes left. Again, it varies state by state, um, and then the best way to do that, the group that stays up with all of the name change processes for each state. Each state has a group that's called Trans Equity. Um, Trans Equity. Uh, it you just look up trans equity and then your state and it will bring you to a website it'll they've done a great job at outlining how to go about that there are sometimes uh, pro bono lawyers who will help you go through the process sometimes there are uh, they can um, direct you to scholarship funds for the name change process or gender marker change process and um, give you the outlines of how that works and, and how you go about doing that um, I know there are three minutes left, so I'm, I want to touch on this as quickly and, and succinctly as possible. Uh, I also went through a name change service that was also a reaffirmation of baptism. And part of that service is the claiming of the name and, and recognizing the, the identity in Christ. One of the things that's important to, to take into consideration, um, and this is part of some some extra work that I'm doing on the side and creating some resources for clergy going forward is uh, the United Methodist, specifically United Methodist baptismal theology says we do not rebaptize individuals. We believe in one baptism uh, because God's grace is sufficient in that one baptism that that God is at work in that in that person's life throughout their life. And therefore, rebaptizing someone is basically saying that, that the initial baptism didn't take. And that's not how it works, is uh, 
as we believe in provenient grace, um, and that even before baptism, God is at work in that child. The baptism is an outward and visible sign that God's grace is present in them. So what do we do when someone says, well, I, I'm a new person. I'm not the same person anymore. And so it, part of it is how the individual uh, views their pre-transition self. And that's different for everyone. Um, I use the example of first myself. Uh, I recognize that pre-transition, I am the same person that I've always been and that, uh, that my pre-transition self is part of who I am and informs who I am. But there are individuals who say, no, when I transitioned, I became a new person. And that person who was beforehand was is dead to me. And, and frankly, that both expressions are, are valid. For any given reason, they're valid. And so we're, we're in deep conversation about how are we theologically consistent in providing pastoral care for transgender individuals. And, um, and being able to recognize who they are in Christ. So we're looking forward to having some of those resources out before the new year, uh, because it, this is something that needs to be discussed and, and really hashed out with, with people um, so that we have a consistent view together so that we can provide these resources for clergy to have those conversations. Um, there will be, uh, I'm finishing up, clearing up a, a service that we can provide a couple of different options for uh, name change services and and um, and reaffirmation of baptism that that combines the two in one, so that we can make be make available. Um, again, it, these are we're out of time, so I didn't really get to go into much much of that detail. But if you are interested in more of that, reach out to Emily. And, and we can get some of that information out to everybody. Thank you so much, um, Dan, John, and Henry, particularly for leading us today and being willing to share with us some of your story and experience. And um, we, we could talk much longer and I, I really appreciate um, your time with us today. I know that many of you um, had comments or thoughts. Um, so two quick things, Jim Waugh put into the chat um, a link to a survey. We really do appreciate your feedback. If you go ahead and click on that, it will just open a browser. You can fill it out um, right after we get done or later on today. Um, those mean a lot to us and we, we seek to listen um, to the needs and desires of this community. We also know that you having the opportunity to share a bit of your story is important and powerful and meaningful for you to share and also for others to receive. Um, so I want to let you know that we are working on another what we call listening post um, that will happen uh, uh, at the first part of May. And that is going to be an opportunity outside of these sessions of learning and, and conversation for you to have an opportunity to share. So just know that that is um, going to be an opportunity for, for you to um, participate. We do uh, love to, you can give feedback on the survey, but if you have a personal question that you just want to um, ask for RMN or PRN or UMADI, we love our acronyms, uh, to be aware of, you can always uh, communicate with us. Um, my email has been on all the communications. Um, but again, thank you for your time today. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something new um, and we will just continue in this journey and conversation again. We have a next session in two weeks. It will be different from this one. So you can go ahead and register um, through that same Eventbrite. Um, you'll see it in RMN's social media and on the Friday recap. Um, but again, thank you for your presence today. We hope that you have a, a blessed weekend. Take care, everybody. Thanks. If I